Dear listeners, today we're starting a brand new creepypasta series called I Can See People's Ages, and it's from the twisted mind of author Spian Superfan, and this is just part one. If you want to hear more, let us know in the comments. Be sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel so you don't miss future episodes of I Can See People's Ages. So turn out the lights, get cozy, part one begins now. Have you seen those stupid little TikTok trends that have been going around lately? You know? The ones where on a person's 18th birthday they can choose between two different abilities? And the choices are some stupid shit. Like being able to see how much money a person has in their bank account. Or being able to see if someone is your soulmate or not. Well guess what? I'm the poor sap that has to live with one of those abilities in real life. I can see how old a person is by the shiny white numbers that float above their head. It's not glamorous or cool. Okay, I take that back. I'm a blast when I go to the county fair and hit up the guess my age stall. I'm being sarcastic if you couldn't tell. My ability is pretty much useless and downright annoying sometimes. I mean, how's a guy supposed to save the world just by knowing how old somebody is? What I'm getting at is... Being able to see people's ages is more of a nuisance than a superpower. The numbers are pretty blinding and my attention always gravitates to right above a person's head. Even if I'm not trying to. Now imagine how that looks to the pretty girl you're talking to, and all they can see is you staring just slightly behind them. I've gotten one too many slaps in the face for doing that. I wasn't always a freak though. There was a period in my life when I was a normal kid with a regular childhood. The seeing people's ages thing happened after the near-death experience I had when I was 10 years old. Thankfully, nothing too traumatic happened. I just got stung by a bee and almost drowned in a pool. It was the end of summer, and my parents were hosting their annual back-to-school BBQ. Everyone had just gone inside to escape the sweltering summer heat and eat some good food. As good as my salt-is-spicy white parents could whip up, that is. I stayed outside to play by myself a bit since I was the only kid there. It was always my parents' friends, and a few extended family members who went to those parties. None of my friends. The party was mostly for my parents who were just celebrating having made it through another summer with me. It's not like I was a bad kid or anything though. Or, maybe I was and I'm just remembering things differently otherwise maybe I wouldn't have almost died. I was ten so my parents didn't worry too much about me playing out in the backyard by myself. After all, at that age I was supposed to be a big boy. Anyway, I was out by the pool playing with some random toy when a bee suddenly landed on my hand. The thing you should know about me is that I'm deathly allergic to bees. Like carrying around an EpiPen in my pocket at all times allergic to bees. I froze when I saw it, too scared to do anything. The bee must have been in a bad mood that day because it decided I was a threat and stung me. Even though I hadn't done anything, I swatted the thing off my hand as a hot, searing pain started to radiate through my skin. I stood up after, freaking the hell out, as I could feel my skin puff up and the sensation of my throat slowly starting to close. In my panic, I hadn't been paying too much attention to my surroundings. One misstep later, and I plummeted into the deep end of our in-ground pool. At least the water was refreshing enough to cool the heat flooding through my veins for a quick second. In that quick second, I remembered the existence of my EpiPen. I frantically grabbed for the life-saving medication in my pocket, feeling what little air supply I had left in my lungs quickly leaving me. My heart sank as I realized my EpiPen wasn't in my pocket anymore. My vision was starting to blur and had become dotted with a bunch of little stars around the edges. I desperately searched around me in the water as I continued to sink deeper. Finally, my eyes landed on the white, blue, and orange pen. Resisting the immense urge to breathe in, I reached out for the EpiPen. The first swipe and it was just at the tips of my fingers. The motion, however, made the pen sink farther away from me. Some bubbles came out of my mouth in a grunt of frustration. That wasn't good seeing as that breath out was about 50% of the oxygen I had left. With all my might, which wasn't much since I was so oxygen deprived, I managed to so swim down and grab my the EpiPen. 
By that point, my vision was almost completely black, and my lips tingled something fierce. Blue to the sky, orange to the thigh. I thought to myself as I uncapped the thing and stabbed myself in the leg, praying the medicine would work underwater. After that, all the fight left me and everything went black and numb. Obviously, I didn't die. Otherwise, I wouldn't be here today typing this out for you to read. I awoke in the hospital about two months later where the doctors informed me I was less than a minute away from dying when I was rescued. Thank God my mom had a gut feeling and went outside to check on me. To this day, she tells me, it was just a little too quiet in the house and I had a bad feeling. Mom found my EpiPen floating on the surface of the pool and my body at the bottom. She jumped in and managed to get me back to the surface where I coughed up most of the water I swallowed, but stayed unconscious. Turns out my brain lost enough oxygen to go into hibernation mode or something, causing my body to enter into a comatose state. It took two months for my brain to get its shit together enough for me to handle consciousness. You'd think the worst part about coming back from a coma would be all the therapy that came after it. The physical therapy to learn how to walk again and regain control over my limbs. The speech therapy to learn how to talk again. The actual therapy where I had to express all my feelings towards what happened to me. Yeah, all that bullshit sucked ass, don't get me wrong. To me though, the worst part was everybody asking me what it was like to be in a coma. I'd constantly been berated by the nurses, doctors, and even my parents about what I remembered during my extended slumber. Which, by the way, wasn't much. It was mostly black nothingness. The only thing I vaguely remember was a dream. There was a garden, big and ethereal, like every plant conceivable to man was planted there and then some. Plants that had never been seen before to the human eye. It could only be described as beautiful. There was also a woman there who was sweet and motherly-like. Her hair was blonde and looked as if her hair had been spun by an orb weaver spider. She wore a long white silk dress and her essence reminded me of a goddess. The most interesting thing about her were her eyes. It's like they changed color every second, never staying one specific hue. I think we had a conversation, but this all happened so long ago I can't tell you what was said. The dream ended with her kissing my forehead. After that was when I woke up. After coming out of the coma, I knew something was different about me. For one, there were these glistening white numbers that were plastered above everybody else's head. It was also like a new purpose had been given to my life. All these years later, I couldn't tell you what it is. Even that feeling of purpose has seemed to dim, having no possible clue what the numbers could mean. I did the reasonable thing any kid would do. Ask the nearest adult. Hey, Dad, what does the number 47 mean? I wrote it on the notepad the hospital staff had given me to write with since I wasn't able to use my vocal cords correctly yet. My father scrunched his eyes in confusion. What are you going on about, Henry? I scribbled some more. The number above your head, the 47? What does it mean? Are you sure you're feeling all right? He asked, eyeing me up and down suspiciously. Like I had just committed a very serious crime. I nodded my head. I felt fine. I just wanted to know what the damn numbers stood for. Instead of answering my question, Dad left the room to track down the nearest doctor. The rest of that afternoon was spent getting a whole bunch of brain scans done, all of which came back normal. I had no growths, tumors, or brain bleeds that would explain why I was seeing numbers above everyone's head. That night I sat in my hospital bed feeling dejected. Nobody could explain to me why I was seeing things nobody else saw. My mother was beside me, rubbing my hand, trying to comfort me. The number 45 glistened above her head, drowning in self-pity and tired from being poked and prodded all day. I fell asleep. That night, I dreamt about the lady in the garden again. She held me in a tight, warm embrace, and then whispered something in my ear. When I woke up the next morning, I felt better, enlightened. Mom, how old are you? I scribbled on the closest napkin after she brought me breakfast. That's an interesting question, dear, she told me. It's a rude question to ask a lady, but I'm 45. It was then that I knew that I could see people's ages. After another month in the hospital, I was finally released and able to go home. What is the first thing you think I did after coming home from the hospital? 
I told all my friends of my new ability, of course. This, my friends, is when my ability started to ruin my life. Nobody believed me, even when I tried to prove it. No one even thought it was cool that I could supposedly see how old a person was. My friends dumped me and I became known as the freak who lied about everything. The bullying was bad, too. Oh god, the bullying. Even my teachers got so annoyed at the insistence of my ability that my parents were called. I got a lecture. The only thing I learned from it was to keep my mouth shut and don't tell anyone that I can see their age. All it would lead to was pain and misery. We eventually moved out of that town, and I got to move schools. It was a fresh start for me, to go to a school where nobody thought I was weird or a liar. Of course, I didn't dare tell anybody about my ability or my past either. I was never the same after all that. I stuck to staying in the shadows. Nobody would notice me if they didn't know I was there after all. To this day, I regret my decision to tell anybody about my curse. High school came and went, and I graduated. High school was enough for me, so I didn't move up to higher education. Instead, I did the only reasonable thing a person in my situation could do, become a bartender. The pay was adequate for the long hours I worked. I got to sleep in on most days, and my boss was chill. His name is Marty, and he owns Marty's. The bar I work at. The place was small and barely up to health code, but I considered it my second home. My first home being the apartment right above the bar that Marty leased to me. My ability made my job a little easier, especially when the state sent in a minor to make sure we were IDing people. I was always at the top of my game. Their spy wouldn't make it three feet from the door before I turned them away. When their fake ID didn't check out either, they sulked right out of the bar. Every time a kid came in with their ironclad fake ID, they got turned around. When they protested that they were of age, I told them that the cops could come down here and verify their age for themselves. That usually got them to stop mouthing off and leave. Now tonight was like any other night at Marty's. I'd been in the middle of a small rush around midnight. How it usually was that time of night slinging drink after drink. I was also alone as usual. Seeing as I was a seasoned bartender, I didn't really need a barback or another bartender, even though the extra help would have been nice. Marty couldn't really afford it, though. It was busy enough where I didn't see her slip in. I had turned around to blend a third frozen margarita for Gladys, one of Marty's regulars. I was stuck in a conversation with her about how good it was to still be youthful. Gladys was full of shit. She always went around telling everyone she was only 46. But her true age sat right above her head in big bold numbers saying 59. When I turned back I noticed the woman sitting there at the end of the bar, as it had become second nature to me. I glanced above her head slightly to see her age. The frozen margarita almost fell out of my hands. The woman had been typing away at her phone so she didn't notice me fumbling. I quickly handed Gladys her margarita before haphazardly trying to recollect myself. What can I get for you tonight? I asked her as confidently as I could muster. I rubbed my eyes, pretending to be a little sleepy. In reality, I rubbed my eyes to make sure I was seeing her age correctly. Above the woman's head in stark white letters was the number 300. At first, I thought I misread the number. After all, she looked like she should have been in her early 30s, not 300. But alas, the number 300 was firm where it stood. Her hair was long, wavy, and a dark shade of ebony, as if her hair was the night sky itself. She had glistening brown eyes that had this hunger behind them. She also wore a shade of red lipstick that popped out at you. For her pale complexion, the color looked really good on her. Ever since I'd gained my ability, the only ages I've seen were normal ones, only going up to three digits once when I met a World War I veteran this woman had to be the oldest person I've ever seen. Against my better judgment, I chalked her numbers up to somehow being a fluke. There was no way someone could actually live to 300 years old, right? I'll have a Bloody Mary, she said with a toothy smile. Something about her perfect white teeth sent shivers down my spine. It irked me. Anything else I can get for you? I asked, remembering it was rude to stare though she seemed to revel in the uneasy look in my eyes. Names are a powerful thing, you know. 
the woman stated as she rested her chin on the backs of her hands. I could tell she was toying with me. I chuckled as I grabbed a tall, skinny glass and a stalk of celery. Well, my name has no power to it. I'm Henry. It's nice to meet you. I stuck my hand out to her. She smiled and let out a small laugh before taking my hand and shaking it. Harley. Harley. What a fitting name for the woman in front of me. She wore a leather jacket over a plain white t-shirt. If I had to describe her in one word, it would be biker girl. I like you, Henry, Harley said, flipping some of her long hair behind her shoulder. The flirtatious action made a knot form in my stomach. Thank you, I said, forcing myself to smile, handing her drink to her. I took a second to look her over again before starting to tend to the other customers in the bar. I made sure to keep an eye on Harley the whole time, my curiosity getting the better of me. About an hour later, one of the regulars, Jeb, started to hit on Harley. He was six beers deep and couldn't tell his ass from a water hose. Come on, sweets. Come back home with the Jeb. I'll treat you right, sugar. We'll have a fun time. He slurred drunkenly as he wrapped a hand holding a bottle of beer around her shoulder. I could see Harley's features contort into an expression of uncomfortableness. All right, Jeb, I started, slinging the towel I was using to clean a glass over my shoulder. I'm cutting you off. Clearly you've had enough to drink tonight. Jeb waved me off and brought his free hand to Harley's boob where he squeezed it gently. A look of shock and fury filled her face. Jeb, I said testingly, grabbing the beer out of his hand. Leave him alone, man. The 18-year-old kid who came in with Jeb shouted from next to the drunkard. The only reason I let him stay at the bar is because he only ordered a can of Coke. Normally, he never caused trouble when him and Jeb came in anyway. Jeb must have been this guy's into college parties since he was only 22. But with a name like Jeb, I'd expected him to be 63. Jeb was getting more handsy and I could tell Harley was going to snap at any moment. The both of you get out of here now. Before I call the cops on you for giving me a fake ID and Jeb for letting you stay in here knowing you were a minor. Like a deer caught in headlights, the kid went, How did you- I cut him off. I don't tolerate harassment of any kind at my bar. Get out, now. Jeb's friend grabbed him off of Harley before quickly running out of the bar and into the streets. Harley dusted herself off while staring at the direction the duo ran away in. She then looked back at me and shot me an icy glare. Thanks, but I could have handled that myself. I shrugged in response and went back to cleaning up around the bar. The rush had ended a while ago and only a few patrons were left. A couple, Gladys and Harley. When I turned back to Harley, I noticed she was gone. In her place was a $5 bill and her drink glass. Not one drop had been sipped from the Bloody Mary. I shrugged the ominous feeling that Harley left behind and went back to my closing duties. I kicked a few drunks out of the bar, called them taxis, and then closed Marty's down for the night. The sound of heels crunching against gravel took my attention off the back door to the bar. A tall shadow stood at the alleyway entrance. I tucked my keys in between my fingers and tightened the grip on the garbage bag in my other hand. Like I said earlier, a familiar voice echoed off the walls in the alley. I can handle myself. Harley stepped into the edge of light coming from a street lamp behind her, wiping something off her face with her sleeve. Blood. Her mouth was covered in blood and she had a crazed look in her eye. Her once white shirt, now a rusted brown color. She smiled at me again. This time two huge fangs hung in her mouth. The word vampire flooded my mind as her age started to shine more intently above her head. The woman before me was literally 300 years old. A 300-year-old vampire. She was on me quick, giving me no time to prepare or defend myself. The garbage bag and keys in my hands fell to the ground as I was stuck in her strong grasp. Harley pulled my black polo down and licked the area where my neck and shoulders connected, sending weirdly pleasurable tingles down my spine. I braced myself for the pain that would come from the bite when she eventually stopped licking me. I heard her hiss as a hot stench of iron filled my nostrils. Don't worry, Henry. I'll make it quick. Harley then clamped her jaw shut as she bit down. I screamed out in pain as I imagined all the blood being sucked from my veins. 
my body withering away into nothing but a husk, and Harley standing over my corpse full and satisfied with my exsanguination. I started crying as my mind flooded with regrets. How much better could my life have been if I never told anyone about my ability? Maybe my parents wouldn't think I was crazy and a disappointment. Maybe I could have gotten a girlfriend, settled down, gotten a nice house and had a kid. In my hysteria, I hadn't noticed there had been no pain at all. Harley had released me. When realization struck, I spun around in confusion. My neck was fine, and not a single blood cell was taken from me. Harley stood behind me chuckling to herself, as if she should have known better. In the palm of her hand was a sharp fang. It belonged to her, seeing as a nice gap was in place where her upper left canine once rested in her gums. Ah, oh, fuck! She yelled out in an angry laugh, stomping her black leather Doc Martens on the ground. Harley looked me in the eye, a deep-seated hatred behind her eyes. You're a goddamn chosen. 